welcome aboard the next segment of Rail Fan Fest 2021, where we're talking Logomotive. Yes, you did hear that correctly, with a G. We're going to be talking to Ian Logan, the author of uh, the latest book out by Sheldrake Press, which is called Logomotive, all about railroad graphics and the American dream. Great. Uh, so welcome, Ian. Welcome to Rail Fan Fest 2021. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, uh, how are you, first of all? Uh, very well, and thank you for asking me. Excellent. So you're here to talk about uh, this fantastic new book, Logomotive, which uh, has already come out in the UK. It came out on the 1st of April. It's due out a little bit later, I believe, in the uh, United States on the 21st. Um, and uh, the, the, the title on the front of the book says Railroad Graphics and the American Dream. And this book is very much focused on uh, the railroad and the, uh, the rail fan scene in, in many respects uh, over in the United States. Um so uh, I think what would be great to kick things off is in, in the opening part of the book, you talk about um, uh, a show that you went over to see in New York and uh, the, a visit that you made um, to, a, to a certain railroad that really boosted that enthusiasm and, and kind of connected some dots for you. Um, and it's a, it's a great story and it's a great way of opening the book. It'd be great if you could just uh, talk a little bit about that and how this uh, American railroad scene really um, kicked things off for you. Um, yeah, I, th I think that it's quite a deep-rooted thing. I, 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 I really have to go back to the 1940s and the early 50s when it was a pretty miserable time in England, in a way, um, with rationing and everything else. And the only thing that we really got were black-and-white films at the local, the local uh, flea pit. And a lot of those early American films... <laughs> sort of showed America as being a pretty wonderful place. And you saw trains and cars and the way they lived and everything. That had quite an influence. And before that, I obviously had an interest in trains and engineering. And uh, I did an apprenticeship at Westinghouse Brake and Signal Company in Chippenham, which I didn't like very much. But it did instill a certain discipline within me. But when I started design after leaving college, I was invited to uh, um, New York with a team of lots of other designers to uh, a Macy's open week for um, British design. And we had a day off, a friend of mine and I, and we, we drove upstate to uh, near Bear Mountain to a little town called um, Cold Springs, we were sitting in a bar drinking with these, these old guys there, which was rather nice, and I heard a train. And I walked out, and the train track was right next to the bar. And along came this freight locomotive, and it was a, um, a GMC-E or F unit, bright green or red. I can't remember which colour it was. Anyway, it had six-foot lettering on the side saying Rock Island, I actually thought I'd died and gone to heaven because I didn't realise that uh, the Rock Island line actually was a, um, a, a line in America. Um, and there were freight cars going past with um, Southern through the heart of the South, and the graphics were just wonderful. And I thought, I am going to come back and do a book on this because I... It's what it's just sensational, and that's really how it started. Excellent, and uh, you mentioned there about the Rock Island Railroad, and I know that there's a there's a musical connection there, and um, you speak in the book about how music, particularly American music, and people like Johnny Cash and um, you know other very famous musicians have spoken about and talk um, sung about, uh, created whole songs and albums about the American Railroad and how the American railroads are really intertwined within the culture and the history of the United States of America. And um, I, I understand there's a connection there with the Rock Island Railroad. Oh, without any doubt. I mean, um, I, I, I have an uncle who's not, not alive anymore called Ewan McCall. And I used to go in the 50s to um, the uh, Hootenannies in London. And I suppose I met quite a few American blues singers um, and that was quite an influence. But again, until I got to America and saw what was happening on, and saw the railroads, I didn't realise that there were so many songs and blues that were about the railroads. I mean, I before this, I wrote down 
35 songs and I could have written down a hundred more. I mean, there are songs of the Chessy system, the flying Virginian, Florida East Coast, the Dixie Flagler, uh, Rock Island Rockets. Um, I mean, it just, they just go on and on and on. Actually, where are they? Casey Jones, Orange Blossom Special, Freight Train, L and N don't stop here anymore. The Warbash Cannonball. Uh, I mean, wonderful, wonderful music, and they all, a lot of them had quite deep meaning. I think the Midnight Special probably was one of the ones that they heard in prisons in the South, and it was a way of escape. Mm. No, it's it's incredible, and uh, you know, you, you touch on um, how you know integral uh, that is. With, with the history of railroads in the United States. I mean, we're talking late 1800s here and, you know, there was there were pioneering railroads connecting parts of the landscape that hadn't seen, you know, anything uh, like a railroad before. You know, they barely had tracks and roads, let alone, uh, you know, rails passing through them. And um, there's uh, many really interesting and sometimes quite tragic stories about how railroads spread across the United States trying to join the Atlantic and the Pacific. And uh, you can see how that area of history and culture, it would have had an impact on people like music musicians and, and people writing songs, as you say, to pass the time. And, uh, and, and, and still and, does. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Still does. It's extraordinary. And you don't, I, I don't think that you get that in any other culture. You certainly don't get it in England. You, I mean, not that the, the last train to Doncaster sounds quite the same as the last train to San Fernando or something, does it? <laughs> no, no, quite, quite. Um, <laughs> and, of course, being a designer, um, a lot of the book is focused on, you know, the, the sort of aesthetics and the designs and um, things like the artwork, the logos, the liveries, and what a lot of these railroads did to advertise themselves. I mean, you know, a lot of them were um, uh, pioneering, you know, quite exquisite passenger services, but also freight as well. And they wanted to advertise exactly what could be carried across their line. So as a designer, what made um, the approach of some of these American railroads so different to the kind of maroons and greens and browns and things that we see here in the UK? Well, I think that the big difference is that the English, um, the English had wonderful logos but they were very traditional and very much um uh, coats of arms and things and and very beautifully done it are mostly victorian but the american ones are sort of not naive but they are just very gutsy and certainly not designed by designers, which was one of the things that really attracted me. They were probably designed by ticket agents with um, on a competition or a railroad executive who, like the, the uh, Santa Fe, where he apparently um, drew it on a silver dollar, uh, the logo, and um, the Rock Island, which is a beaver pelt, or some people say it's a buffalo skin, but they, they related somehow to that sort of new um, and gutsy feeling of America, which uh, which I like. Mm. No, it's incredible, and uh, again, it all comes back to the history in a way because I know uh, you know a lot of these logos to begin with, at least. Um, included some quite iconic imagery of, of perhaps locations and some of the specific places that these railroads were going from too. Um, an example being this one, I noticed there was one railroad um, with a Minuteman, you know, for the, the Boston Minutemen um, as, as a logo and um, the Mountain Goat as well was a, was a feature of another railroad. I can't remember which one. So That was, the, the Mountain Goat was done by one of the directors of the railroad who was traveling there and saw mountain goats and he thought oh that looks like a good idea <laughs> excellent yeah it, i mean it's an incredible it's an incredible subject and um you know the the, the design element is, is naturally what the book is all about uh, in many ways i mean the images um some of which we will be showing uh, throughout the course of this interview and uh, there's a fantastic introductory video that um, sheldrake press have offered us and uh, uh, people will have seen that before the start of this interview some incredible incredible images and that the, the sort of grandeur in many ways of American railroads lends itself to such iconic logos spread across the whole sides of box cars and, and things like that. It's, um, it's, uh, it, it's fascinating. Um, so coming on then to the, to the locations and some of the places it, towards the end of the book, you describe 
uh, again through a series of fantastic photographs, a journey that you made across almost the entire breadth of the United States. And uh, that was a little bit later, I think, in the 70s. Uh, that, yes, that was at the same time, actually, in the early 70s. Mm. So um, the, the thing about that, as I say, to sort of conclude the book, uh, it's the, the, there's so much to, to be talked about with the, with the journeys themselves. I think you mentioned that you were in the cab of that locomotive for some 23 hours or something. And, um, yeah. I, 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 again, I... <laughs> I think one of the things about all of this is that I did it before the internet and life is so much easier to get things and to, um, I mean, I did it on the hoof when I went uh, in the seventies to photograph. Um, and I was just going from town to town to try and I'm just walking around freight yards, which you cannot do anymore. There's no way you can do it. Um, you, you just get prosecuted. Um, but the things that got me in America when, when I was on the train, I, I remember we were, I was snoozing, I think, and it was the middle of the night, and the engineer sort of said, um, are you awake? And I said, yes, what is it? And we were travelling right down the main street of Reno, Nevada. I'm not sure that that line is still there, but... Then it's that's when I realized that the railroads built America. The railroads went through and then they built a town or they built a town to um, to, to get people to come there and uh, and start a town. But the railroads just are the most powerful thing in America. It's extraordinary. And, and in many ways, they continue to be. I mean, um, so it, absolutely. Absolutely. It's uh, what, what one thing that, uh, or a section of the book that I think is really interesting is when uh, you and, and Jonathan Glancy, who you uh, co-authored this book with you, uh, people in the UK will know him as someone who's presented programs and written many books on railways in, in the past and uh, was the uh, architectural editor for the Guardian newspaper at one stage. Um, yeah. You talk about these streamliners. Now, if there's ever um, I, a sort of like iconic look of a train at speed, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about Mallard and TGV and the bullet train in Japan and things like that. But the stream, these streamliners in America were totally different to any of that. And in many ways kind of predate all those modern fast trains of today. Well, I, I again, I was looking at, um, uh, where was I? I was looking at the, 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 the B&O Railroad Museum in America. I've just restored, if you, you can look at it, actually, it's our, um, restored engine number 51. It's the only one that's left. And it was the first streamliner that General Motors made in 1937. It's a Model EA. It is so beautiful and so advanced. And this is uh, around the same time as the, the, um, the, the, the stainless steel one that... Um, Burlington Northern did, but it they've restored it and it is so beautiful. The Americans also were very good at making making trains and aeroplanes or anything else look streamlined by paintwork, and the paintwork is just beautiful, like custom cars. Is um, but if but this one is beautiful. Mm. And they are very advanced, and they there's not a lot of difference between that train and the ones that are flying across Europe now. No, of course. I mean, um, technology moves on, but they still look perhaps as fast as as those streamers. They still are. look fast, yes. Yeah, exactly, and uh, I mean, even today, um, brands like Amtrak are introducing even faster services. I know they've had uh, the Acela brand for for some time, and they've got some new Liberty trains on the way, and. Um, they are very different to those streamliners and the Hiawathas and uh, all, the, all those uh, other streamline um, trains of the past. Uh, but speed is very much still a thing in the US, I think, and, and perhaps even more so now. They, 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 they've got a massive problem in, in America because the beauty for me, of course, is the private railroads. But of course, to build a railroad across America, it's only the taxpayer that can pay for that. I mean, you know, China's built 15,000 miles of rail track and the private companies in America do not like Amtrak, which is a 
terrible shame. I mean, it has to go across all the private lines and they're not very fast. No, of course. I mean, Amtrak today is a, is a well-respected brand, and even outside of the U.S. I mean, it's probably the only U.S. brand I'd heard of before I uh, you know, really got into the sort of U.S. railroad inside of things. Um, but you're right. Yeah, it is, it's a difficult situation. And, um, uh, but as I say, you know, that with the technology and um, the way that they're going, as I say, with these new, these new trains that they're introducing, um, yeah. you know, I think um, things are, are on the up. Um, but they still have to use the track of Union Pacific and all the others. Quite, quite. Um, that, you know, really a passenger search. The Americans have got the technology to do it, that they could do it and they could do the most wonderful trains. And it would be, there is no doubt about it, travelling across America on the train is magic because it's such a diverse country. Yeah, I mean, plenty of different landscapes to go through. And in fact, oh. uh, again, when uh, in sort of one of the early chapters of the book and, and in other rail, railroad books as well, some of the some of the parts of America that needed to be traversed by rail. You're talking things like mountain railroad passes, um, the the the, um, the the Salt Lake, uh, Utah, I think, has a railway going through it um, that's still used by by freight. Um, you mentioned about going through towns and cities, and still today, there's YouTube footage of um, you know these locomotives going through the centers of towns. Um, and they call it- they call it street running. Street running, yeah, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> there's all these different landscapes that these railroads have got to go through. Much more than anything that the UK would ever have to tackle. Okay, we've got the odd mountain railway, and we've got the odd bit of you know woodland, and perhaps the, the coastline is probably the most uh, dangerous thing that we have to contend with. Um, but uh, it, it, it is it is totally different, and I can totally understand yeah. your sentiment that travelling across the states by a railroad is perhaps the best way to do it. Of course, there are no bridges. Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why they can have double-decker trains. Yeah, I mean, the space that they've got to play with is obviously much greater, and um, uh, that's potentially one of the downfalls of, of, of things uh, here in the UK. Um, I, I still get quite a thrill in America when I, when I see a freight train. I think also anywhere you go in America, any town you're in, if you listen, you'll hear the air horns of trains all the time. You hear the, in, even in the middle of Los Angeles, you'll, you'll hear in the distance these wonderful air horns that they have. And I love the, the, the newer American um, freight trains. I just love their functionality. I think they're great big gutsy things. It's, it's really interesting. We uh, On the We Are Rail Fans website, we ran an article um, a few months ago about the S-160 steam locomotive, which was an American locomotive, um, but it was actually used, it was exported and used across Europe and in the UK during the Second World War. And there is actually one of these um, locomotives, and there's a couple actually still about here in the UK, and I was fortunate enough to see one running in, in, in Somerset. Um, and the whistle is totally different to anything that you would hear from a typical British steam locomotive um at least the one fitted to the, to the one i saw and they start, the english sound rather quaint well it, it's almost it's almost like a polite <laughs> whistle isn't it in a way yes. and uh, yet the yes. american locos come through and as it, again you see footage of um even you know the, the modern diesel electrics um and you know the horns make they make you feel american in a way when you hear yeah. them it's quite extraordinary Oh, the air horns, I think. I, I mean, I'll never forget it when we were coming into Cheyenne when I was in the cab. And they have to, they, they mark off mileposts. And um, the engineer looked at me and said, do you want to pull the air horns? Couldn't believe it. I mean, pulling that air horn was just wonderful. <laughs> never forget it. No, once in a lifetime, I imagine. Yeah, incredible. Oh, Yeah. Uh, great. Well, I mean, it's been great talking to you, Ian. Um, you know, the, the book is fantastic. I, I feel yeah, that, thank um, you very much. In a very privileged position to be able to read it, both you and Jonathan, and all credit to Jonathan as well for the, the work he did for the book um, because it's. Uh, uh, I think without Jonathan, the book wouldn't have been anything. I, I mean, he uh, when I asked him if he'd do it, it was I was so pleased. He because he's such a wonderful writer, and he's got the same sort of enthusiasm that I've got, if not more. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a it's a fantastic book, and uh, I'm sure readers on both sides of the Atlantic will really enjoy it. As I say, as a British rail fan, you know, it was um, it echoed in many ways some of the feelings I have towards the American railroads and that that excitement, that um, 
uh, almost sort of untouchable, uh, the, the, something of, of a fictional tale about it almost in, in some ways. But it's real. It really exists. There are these railroads out there. But also, the, you know, on the American side, you know, the, the – the broad array of places that you describe and the railroads um, that are described oh. throughout the book and, and the images in particular. I mean, this book is all about the illustrations and there are so many fantastic illustrations in this book. It's uh, it's it's brilliant. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed reading it and I know many others will too. So uh, um, that's really, really nice of you. I'm very, very pleased. No, it's excellent. Um, so as I say, thanks very much for talking to us. And uh, yeah, it's been absolutely fascinating learning about your enthusiasm and just how... Um, how important the American railroads are. Thank you very, very much indeed, Joseph. I really appreciate it.